I'm Jason Bellamy, and I'm here at Next 2017, where we're doing more broadcasts here in Boston. And I'm joined by Dr. Richard Shields, who just completed the Mary McMillan Lecture. So first of all, congratulations. Thank you very much. Um, you. Tremendous honor for the profession. It was everything you would want a McMillan Lecture to be. It was inspiring. It was challenging. It was thought-provoking. You covered a lot of ground and a lot of topics, and it's going to be a disservice to try and cram it into 10 to 15 minutes. But we'll, we'll sort of try and hit the highlights. So first of all, the title was Turning Over the Hourglass. And uh, so just in a general sense, what do you mean by that? What's the thought behind that metaphor? Well, the hourglass has always been um, a fascinating instrument to me. But you know, the hourglass portrays that we, we have the opportunity to turn something over and reset a clock. And it occurred to me that that's what physical therapists do. They turn over the hourglass and you know, extend life to patients that are, that are immobile. So, um, you know, the whole notion of any time that we start a new vision or we, we strive to do something new, we have to have a timeline with it. And so turning over that hourglass is something that we need to do periodically, but it has a lot of underlying meanings, not only with patient care, but in the management and the, the progression of a uh, professional group. So um, turning over an hourglass was actually, some have attributed it to Socrates. Um, but the, the unusual thing about it is it's a fixed flow of time. And yet what we can do with the hourglass with patients is extend time. And so I think that's kind of the novelty as to why I chose that title. So when I think about turning over the hourglass, I, I think of a lot of physical therapists thinking, yeah, that's exactly what I do, right? It, it sounds very familiar. Um, and yet at the same time, um, there's that sort of metaphorical part of it, but you also talk about a biological part of it, and, and you're getting down basically to the epigenome level at that point. Um, as, as clearly as you can without the visual aids and stuff like that, I mean, you're dropping knowledge with, you know, PCG1 alpha and everything <laughs> like that. But, but take me through that, because I think that was, for a lot of people, really eye-opening. So where are, what, take me through that and how, honestly, truly, in a biological level, you can turn over the hourglass, in effect. Yeah, so it, it, it really needs to start with um, our capacity to measure the genome. So if you think about it, 20 years ago, for me to analyze the genome in my laboratory would have cost $10 million. Today, we can do it for a couple hundred dollars. And what that's done is it's opened up doors, which allows us to study the effect of things like movement on gene regulation. So we can now capture what is the effect of a certain type of movement on the epigenome. And don't get caught up with the details of the words. But quite simply, the epigenome is merely the way that you promote a gene that is good for you, or repress or turn down a gene that is not good for you. And so it turns out, quite fortunate for physical therapists, that human movement is a very powerful way to turn on some very, very healthy genes. And it's just we never had the capacity to measure that. But with the uh, reduction in cost for us to now to do genomic analysis, it's a whole new frontier. It's an opportunity to really capture what I referred to in the talk as precision physical therapy. And that would be, and, I, and let's go with that a little further, that would be, you talk about really specific prescription of the right, exact right kind of movement. And so you talked about how much more affordable this research is, but in terms of what you imagine, where could we be in, let's say, five years? What, what's realistic in terms of the amount of growth we could have in the profession to sort of take those steps in, say, five years? So right, right off the bat, <clears throat> as genomic analysis becomes customary for anyone who enters a, a hospital and has that sequencing done, there's a potential then to classify them, much like they're doing today with certain drugs. Before you're um, given a prescription for a certain drug type, they'll all, often genotype you because they know people carrying certain kinds of genetic um, 
uh, mutations and so forth will not respond or it could be dangerous for the drug. The same thing will happen in the next five to 10 years as we look at physical therapy in that how we dose uh, human performance, there are some types of exercises that may not be as helpful for someone who is um, expressing a certain gene. So I would say in five to 10 years, I think you're going to see a whole classification of how to differentially try to hypertrophy skeletal muscle or make it bigger um, based on a genetic profile. And that will be guided by that genotyping. So another thing you really went into was the patient experience. And um, you talked about uh, getting to an experience efficiency index, and you went through this airline example that I think is a great example. So give me the short version of that. Well, you know, I asked the audience um, how many of them, you know, made a call to their airline, um, telling the airline how grateful they were that they arrived in Boston safely. And, um, you know, what I tried to do is make the point that, that our experience, let's just say, with flying, um, you know, we expect certain things, like we're going to arrive safely. We wish something different. We wish to arrive early. Um, and then there's an unexpected event that might be that if you, your flight was canceled or something else. So the bottom line is, you know, we all go into the human experience with various expectations. And that's common with our patients as well. And so we need to drill down to better understand what our patients are coming in with. What are their expectations? Refine and refocus those expectations as to whether it's, you know, if what they're wishing for is not attainable, then we refocus and we direct, uh, redirect accordingly. So I use the flying experience to try to bring it home because we've all had issues associated with flying. Yeah, that was perfect. And, and I, on that note, I want to quote two things. So I'm going to go to my notes here. So, you know, you said, um, you know, when the pa what the patient wishes for or desires is not always what they need. And it's our professional re responsibility to redirect those expectations. So that's exactly what you said. And then also people seek our services with the expectation that they'll learn something new that sets them on a path to improved health. Um, so I want to go do with this patient experience thing in one other way. And, and this will feel like maybe a little bit of a curveball, but uh, one of the problems that's happened with the opioid epidemic, for example, for prescribers has been based on patient expectation, right? So the idea that patients have come in and what they're expecting or what they're, or what they're demanding is a reduction of pain, and therefore prescribers have felt like, I need to, to do this, and the answer has been opioids. So um, how, how can physical therapists avoid making a similar mistake? They're not prescribers of opioids, for example, but essentially avoid the patient in trying to meet their desires, sending them in a negative direction. What's the skill that they need? Yeah, and that's where it's important um, to understand what the patient's expectations are. You give a great example with the opioid epidemic. Um, clearly, one is doing good when they redirect away from something that is not in the best future interest of the client. And so when the, when the client or the patient becomes confident that someone has their best interests in mind, that's why this human experience is so important. And it's not a matter of, if it's just a matter of satisfaction, you give them what they want and you measure satisfaction at the end and everybody's happy. No, you need to know what their expectation is and then redirect it. And that takes responsibility. That's not an easy thing to tell somebody. Um, for example, in my field, everybody who has a spinal cord injury wants to walk but not everybody will. And in the example that I showed you, okay, now we're best invested in your future health. And for you, redirecting it from walking may be that you are going to be independent in a wheelchair for life, but lead a happy and healthy life. So, you know, your example with the opioid is, you know, people have to step up and take responsibility rather than just um, reduce pain for today and suffer the consequences for tomorrow.
Absolutely. So there, there are two other things I want to talk to you about. And, and one is uh, you, you were obviously passionate about research. You talked about the All of Us Research Project and the need for a physical therapist to participate within that. So for people who don't know what that is, describe that for me briefly and what the opportunities are. Yeah, so the na I'm on the uh, council to the National Institutes of Health. And uh, what they've been working on is uh, initiating the, one of the largest data collections ever in the history of the National Institutes of Health. And they're recruiting one million people from all diverse backgrounds. And they're going to follow them longitudinally for the next 10 years. And they're going to take things like molecular data and um, biological samples where they can look at biomarkers and metabolism and aging and overall health along with lifestyle and um, you know recordings of their movements and so forth and um, you know now the first goal of that would be to better know how to prescribe drugs so it just so happens that you know they're realizing that certain prescriptions while works on the face of things, if someone's very active or they don't sleep or they have other issues, it may not be as effective. So what they're moving this towards is precision medicine. What I've brought into the discussion is precision physical therapy. And therefore, if physical therapists or clients that physical therapists see are enrolled in that database and they're having certain types of movement or activity-based programs, then there's a possibility that that data will cluster to those who have um, certain risk that do pretty well over like a Framingham-like study would support the value of movement as clustering in this one million collection sample. So then the last question is, uh, and I want to give you a chance to give props to Iowa, um, you talked about student education and um, what changes need to happen there and data that we need on the academic development of physical therapists. So what is Iowa doing along those lines and what was your challenge? Yeah, so, I mean, we need benchmarks and we need to be able to benchmark to every other academic institution. And this is not new. Other doctoring professions have been doing this. And so what we did is, because we did not have physical therapy data to benchmark to, I'm in a medical school, and I see the AAMC data all the time, so I just said, okay, I'm going to benchmark to medicine. It's a health profession, and it's nice to know how we stand relative to medicine. It turns out that pharmacy and veterinary medicine and um, several other doctoring professions do have benchmarks. So, you know, my, my real um, call as a part of this Macmillan address is to say, you know, we need to know what the data looks like. Um, we don't want to just rely on a magazine that ranks programs and so forth just on general perceptions. We actually need data to support what are the best programs in the country and why? And so by having benchmarks, I think we can really up the level. And the, the stakeholder in that is the student. I mean, the, there's no reason that a student shouldn't be able to look out there and know what institution they're applying to and what they're made of in terms of benchmarking. Richard Shields is a tremendous McMillan lecture again. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you very much. So uh, we'll be doing more broadcasts from here, but if you want more of these and you're watching live right now, jump over to the APJ Student Assembly Facebook page where Cruz Romero is going to be up in just a few minutes with some more interviews here from Boston. I'm Jason Bellamy, and I'll catch you later.